who framed Roger Rabbit as the groundbreaking movie that featured real actors interacting with animated characters. Now I know in today's world they'll just CGI anything, but back in the 80s this was pretty spectacular. <laughs> And while doing this video, I discovered you cannot do a Roger Rabbit impression without feeling like a completely worthless piece of shit. Like, it's impossible. Like, most of the impressions I do are just kind of fun little things to do. Roger Rabbit impressions are embarrassing as hell. Like, I tried to do one, and even though I was alone, I felt great shame and self-loathing. So you will not be getting a Roger Rabbit impression today. I guarantee that. And then my producer was able to secure the laser disc of Who Framed Roger Rabbit. So, yeah. We'll be able to pause and see everything. <laughs> If you know what I mean. Who Framed Roger Rabbit takes place in Hollywood in 1947, where cartoon characters, or toons, reside in a specialized area of Los Angeles known as Toontown, but they interact with humans on a daily basis. And the toons are also real actors just like any other Hollywood legend like Ray Bolger, or that one dude that just randomly showed up in the background of early 2000s sex comedies. We then meet private detective Eddie Valiant, played by Bob Hoskins, who used to have a great working relationship with Toons, along with his brother and partner Teddy, but he's now a depressed alcoholic after Teddy got murdered by a Toon five years earlier. Seen cooing over calamari with not so new sugar daddy was Jessica Rabbit, wife of Maroon cartoon star Roger. And I've mentioned this before, but growing up, I had no idea that Bob Hoskins was British. And honestly, I'm still not convinced that he was. Hold on. Yep. Uh, IMDB says that Bob Hoskins was born in Tupelo, Mississippi, and he lived there for his entire life, never once leaving the continental United States. And one of the big names in tunes is Roger Rabbit, whose performance has been slipping lately. Look what it says. It says rabbit gets clunked. Rabbit sees stars, not birds. Oh shit, that's usually the first sign of a pretty serious meth addiction. Oh, I'm sorry, this is a kid's movie. A cartoon meth addiction. And the head of Maroon Cartoon Studios, RK Maroon, hires Eddie to investigate rumors that Roger's wife Jessica is having an affair with Marvin Acme. And Marvin Acme owns both the Acme Corporation and Toontown. Valiant heads to the hottest toon club in town, the Ink and Paint Club, where Jessica Rabbit is a performer. And it's pretty awesome to have all these popular cartoon characters in one movie, and I'm so glad this movie came out in the 80s before the internet. Otherwise, thousands of the smelliest people you've ever seen would take to their keyboards to call it low-key cringe, and Eddie runs into Marvin Acme at the club. If it's Acme, it's a gasser. Put it there, pal. <laughs> the hand was a still our biggest seller. And now this movie, along with Tim Burton's Batman, made me want to buy a hand buzzer. And now, in regards to Batman, I knew that if I bought a hand buzzer, it wouldn't cook my enemies to a crisp, but I was still hoping for, like, some kind of permanent injury. I feel like that's what we were promised. But yeah, hand buzzers are very mild fun. And plus, they were gigantic. Our tiny eight-year-old hands couldn't conceal a hand buzzer. We basically had to hold our hand behind our back and force someone to shake our hand. And even if the stars aligned and you somehow got someone to shake your hand, you had to really squeeze just to get a one-second So kids, if you want to startle your classmates, save yourself 50 cents. And when you shake their hand, just do that thing of where your middle finger is kind of tucked in and you kind of caress the inside of their hand with it. Trust me, that will freak them out more than any joy buzzer ever could. Like, they'll feel gross and dirty all day. It's hilarious. And then comes time for Jessica Rabbit to perform, and everyone is just really keyed up for her. In the movie and in real life. Like, the scene direction whenever Jessica Rabbit was on screen had to be hilarious. Robert Zemeckis was like, okay, now this cartoon lady with gigantic cartoon knockers is rubbing those cartoon fun bags all over your face. And you are just horned up beyond belief by those cartoon bazongas. I feel like for most kids, Jessica Rabbit was their first sexual awakening, which was immediately tempered by the fact that they were most likely watching this movie with their parents. And after the show, Valiant takes pictures of Jessica and Acme playing patty cake, which is, I guess, the tuned version of but is also quite literally just playing patty cake. They tell Roger and he's understandably devastated and he runs off. Eddie gets drunk in his office and we have some good exposition about his life before everything fell apart. And the Valiant and Valiant Detective Agency rescued Huey, Dewey, and Louie from a child sex ring and cleared Goofy of espionage charges. Now I know Goofy is a complete ding-dong that gets into all sorts of crazy predicaments, but what the hell were the circumstances that led to him being accused of being a spy? Did he accidentally roller skate into the Pentagon and crash into secret files before we're plunging over a cliff and making this noise. <laughs> I can actually picture that. Oh, Goofy, you are incorrigible. The next day we find that Marvin Acme was murdered and Roger is the prime suspect and Eddie goes to investigate Acme's warehouse 
which is right on the border of Toontown. And like, how does Toontown work? Like, it's not just a section of the city for Toons to live. Like, it's actually a cartoon city. Even the sky is a cartoon. Is the oxygen real? I don't know how you would draw oxygen, but it's a real element. So can cartoon trees produce real life oxygen? And how does the cartoon sun work? Like, there doesn't seem to be any barrier between their world and ours. Like, it's just right there. Where is the cutoff from the real sky to the cartoon sky? And another thing, and helping with the investigation is Judge Doom. And now his name is Doom. Christopher Lloyd is portraying him as just the creepiest dude imaginable. He has weasels working for him. He is clearly a villain. So there is nothing more that he needs to do to cement that in the minds of, again, the children who are watching this movie. <laughs> Okay, movie, you made your point. Judge Doom is scum. Reading you loud and clear. So there is really no need to hurt this shoe. Which seems to be a baby, by the way. Remember how I always thought there wasn't a way to kill a tomb? Well, Doom found the way. Turpentine, acetone, benzene. He calls it the dip. Okay, we can tell you mean business. Let's put that little squeaking shoe back in storage, huh? I'll catch the rabbit, Mr. Valiant. Then I'll try him, convict him. And execute him. Yep, that was horrifying. So, does Judge Doom need to convict Roger in order to have him executed? Because he just murdered that shoe in cold blood, and like nobody tried to stop him. Valiant gets a visit from Roger's co-star, Baby Herman, who tells Eddie that Acme had a secret will saying that he would leave Toontown and control the tunes upon his death, but nobody knows where the will is. But Eddie finds the will in the pictures that he took of Acme and Jessica as they were slapping their hands together until Acme ejaculated? Still not sure how the whole patty cake thing works. Like, Roger was pissed the hell off when he saw those pictures, so there must be more layers to playing patty cake than humans are aware of. Like, did she eventually play patty cake on Acme's bare bottom? Like, was that the implication? I just don't know what this PG movie is exactly going for. And so Roger appears in Eddie's office and insists that he was set up. At, or framed, I guess. It's the name of the movie, you f***ing idiot. We learned that the night Acme died, Roger did go to confront him, but Jessica and Acme had already left after Jessica clapped her hands together on Acme's erect penis? I, I don't know. I'm just spitballing here. So Roger wrote Jessica a love letter on a blank piece of paper that he found there. How do I love thee? Let me count the ways. One one thousand, two one thousand. Oh, Roger. Have some self-respect, man. Your wife patted another man's cakes. That's not something you can just forgive, regardless of how hot she is. And as a joke, Roger handcuffs himself to Valiant right as the weasels show up. If the weasels get their hands on me, I'm as good as them. Oh, God. I can only imagine how loud Roger's death would be if he were dipped. Like, I guess, luckily, the toddler shoe hadn't learned to speak yet. So while horrible, its death was mercifully quiet. Roger, on the other hand, holy hell. He'd be doing impressions and shit while just screaming in sheer agony. And Eddie reluctantly takes Roger to his friend Dolores's, who lets Roger hide in the bar she works at so they can formulate a plan to find Acme's will. And so Jessica goes to see Eddie at his office. And remember how we were talking about the things you could see with the laser disc? Check this out. If you pause it right here, boom. Some eye candy for the ladies. And I think we should demand that this be considered the ideal body type for tough guys again. Oh my god, that was just the golden age for schlubs. And Jessica says that the whole patty cake incident was a setup by RK Maroon in order to blackmail Acme, and he told her that if Jessica didn't go along with it and patty cake with Acme, then Roger would never work in this town again. Fingering Acme's butthole was just a case of Jessica getting caught up in the moment. I mean, she is a performer. Go big or go home. Dolores shows up and says that the Cloverleaf Company has put a bid to buy Toontown, and Cloverleaf will own it outright unless they can find the will by midnight. They go to confront Maroon about the deal with Cloverleaf, and Maroon tells Eddie that he blackmailed Acme into selling his company so he could sell the studio, and then admits that he only did that so he could protect the tunes. Maroon is then murdered by an unseen assassin before he can explain the consequences of the missing will, and Eddie sees Jessica fleeing the scene and assumes that she's the killer, so he follows her into Toontown. He catches up to Jessica in Toontown, and she reveals that Doom killed Acme and Maroon, and Acme had given her the will for safekeeping, but the paper was blank. Acme also gave her syphilis, but that's a whole different story. Jessica and Eddie get captured by the weasels and taken to the Acme factory, where Doom reveals that he's the sole shareholder of Cloverleaf Industries and he's going to destroy Toontown with a giant dip spraying machine and then put a freeway in its place. I mean, when we're having the discussion of most evil movie villain of all time, Doom's got to be in the top five, right? I mean, what he did to the poor shoe that was probably only in shoe kindergarten is horrific enough on its own, but he's going to commit Toon genocide just to get his urban renewal project off the ground? Roger shows up to help but is immediately captured. You're magnificent. Was I really better than good? Ugh, better than Goofy. Can you imagine Goofy Goof playing patty cake with Jessica Rabbit? 
Gorsh, that tickles my taint. Nope, nope, can't. It's even worse than Roger Rabbit. So they're about to kill Jessica and Roger, but Eddie starts to do his cartoon buffoonery and it causes the weasel to die of laughter. So like the main reason the tunes exist is to make people laugh, but they themselves can be killed by laughing too much? What? The lore of Toontown is just insane. And then these weasels go to cartoon heaven, even though the weasels clearly don't follow the values taught by cartoon Jesus. Eddie then fights Doom, who is flattened by a steamroller but survives, revealing himself as a disguised tune, specifically the tune that killed his brother Teddy. After a struggle, Eddie empties the machine's fly onto the factory floor, spraying it all over Doom and melting him to death. The police show up and the tunes come in to gawk, and judging by their reactions, this is not the first dead body they've seen. They discover that Acme wrote his will in disappearing ink, and Roger had it the whole time. So Toontown is saved, and Roger's name is cleared, and those pictures of his wife with another man will live on forever once they invent the tune internet. And so that was the classic Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Directed by Robert Zemeckis and written by Peter Seaman. Again, I watched this with my mother, you sick freaks!